Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. This is the National Girls Collaborative Project National Webinar, Families and STEAM, Strengthening Relationships and Building Partnerships. Um, thank you to those who, while they were joining, took a moment to answer the poll question. We have a great group in the audience today from all different types of um, STEM related careers. So we're happy to see you here also from all across the country. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here and to learn with us. A few quick housekeeping items. Um, live transcript is turned on. If you're not seeing it on your computer, but you would like to see it, you can click the dot, dot, dot at the bottom of your Zoom screen and it says more. And then you can select either live transcript or view full transcript to see the transcript happening live. I am going to go ahead and end our poll and we will go and get started in our content today. So we're going to just get started with a little bit of information about the National Girls Collaborative Project, and then we'll get into our speakers. So again, welcome to the National Girls Collaborative Project National Webinar, Families and STEAM, Strengthening Relationships and Building Partnerships. Before we hear from her, from our speakers, I'm going to share some information about the National Girls Collaborative Project. The vision of the National Girls Collaborative Project is to support and create science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, experiences that are as diverse as the world we live in. To do this, NGCP connects, creates, and collaborates with a network of advocates to promote equity and transform STEM for girls and all youth. NGCP exists because today's STEM experiences continue to lack diversity. Many young people do not identify with the field. To create change, our work empowers providers, educators, leaders, and youth themselves. The goal of the National Girls Collaborative Project, um, we believe that STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. Our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and webinars like this one. NGCP also strengthens the capacity of programs by producing and sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. We distribute these resources in accessible formats, such as train the trainer programs, partnerships, and online platforms. And finally, we leverage our network of girls serving STEM programs, advocates, and youth, so that together we can create the tipping point for gender equity and STEM. The National Girls Collaborative Project engages in many activities, both virtually and nationally, as well as through local collaboratives. NGCP partners with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute and the Million Girls Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Networks, serving hundreds of educators via large local networks. NGCP is also working with Lida Hill Philanthropies and has launched the If Then Collection, a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These media are available at no cost. NGCP manages the Connectory, the largest national database of STEM opportunities. The Connectory also provides a way for program providers to connect and collaborate with each other. And Fab Femmes is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They're passionate about the work they do and ready to connect with programs to spark girls' interests. We also offer regular webinars like this one, focused on research and exemplary practices to help our no network grow and thrive. And locally, state collaborative lead teams offer convenings, providing professional development, mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available, as well as distribute their own regular newsletters, spotlighting local resources. The National Girls Collaborative Project has been partially funded by the National Science Foundation since 2002. We began as the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project, focused on Washington and Oregon, and then, as we presented our collaboration model to others, we were invited to expand across the United States. While NGCP programs and partners are in every state, we have 33 collaboratives serving 41 states, 
facilitating collaboration between 42,500 organizations who serve 20.2 million girls and 10 million boys. And with that, I'm going to give a quick little introduction to who is joining us for this webinar today. Um, this webinar was planned in collaboration with Linda Kakelis of STEM Next. She is the Family Engagement Advisor with STEM Next. And we will also hear from both the practitioner perspective and a research perspective. So Delia Meza is the Director of Family Learning and Community Partnerships at the New York Hall of Science. And Smirla Ramos Montañez is the Family STEM and Learning Researcher at Turk. And to get us started, I will turn it over to Linda who will introduce herself and share some background information about why a focus on family engagement and partnership is so important for STEM learning. Thank you, Marissa and Kata and NGCP, so much for hosting this event. And for all of you who are joining us today, I'm thrilled to share alongside Delia and Smirla. We're here to discuss how to weave family engagement into every element of your work. We can't close the opportunity gap just by doing more STEAM programs. Really, family engagement is that secret sauce for engagement and persistence in STEAM and also for success in school. Next slide, please. A little bit about me. Family engagement has been my lifelong passion, um, both personally and professionally as a parent and now as a grandma. I've had the chance to share a love for STEAM and to access lots of research and also programs. As founder and past CEO of TechBridge Girls, I learned from families how these resources are not so um, equally accessible. And now as an advisor for STEM Next, I'm working to bridge research and practice in support of family engagement so that really every family has access to resources that we develop. My contact information is here, and I really want to be a thought partner to you as you go on your journey around family engagement. Please follow up and contact me if there's any way that I can help support you. Next slide. We are here to share on how to reimagine family engagement. We want to step back from putting our efforts into those one time family events at the end of a program where caregivers come to us, where we talk and they listen where we set up fun, engaging STEM activities, but then they go home and it's what's next. Um, we wanna really reimagine family engagement by building relationships with families, where we listen to families and design our programs with them based on what they want and need. From listening, I learned that caregivers most want to understand what their child's learning in programs and in school and how they can help support their child. And when it comes to STEAM, we want to encourage caregivers, especially mothers um, like this uh, mom in the slide, who think that she can't help her daughter because she doesn't have a formal education, isn't experienced in engineering and might lack confidence. Um, what parents don't know about the research is that it's their encouragement that really matters most in terms of their child's activation and persistence in STEM. And this mom is already helping her daughter just by asking questions, by inviting her child to share and talk about what she's doing and learning, and also by sharing her own skills and passions around like cooking or sewing um, or tinkering and repairing household objects. Next slide. There are lots of STEM programs and resources in person and online, but we really need to stop and ask who participates in our summer programs, who can find our online um, resources, and who are we missing? I personally love this example from TechBridge Girls that ask these kinds of questions. They have been very successful in getting girls in their after school programs, but not so successful in supporting Somali girls. They tried to connect with Somali families at back to school events. Um, but weren't successful, and they didn't give up. Instead, they looked to partner with a group, the Somali Youth and Family Club that had deep ties with families um, in the community and listened and learned about potential barriers and also solutions for working around them. In the end, through this partnership, they were successfully able to host a series of workshops with over 40 mothers over eight months that were held at the apartment complex where the moms lived. 
Um, they offered childcare, they engaged with engineering design activities that were hands-on, and they really connected with the mom's experiences rebuilding their homes in Somalia. And then they shared practical ideas and resources for the mothers to be able to do to support their daughters um, in STEAM. And I really encourage you to think about the families you want to reach, but maybe haven't been su successful at, and thinking about who you can partner to help do that work. Next slide. Over the last two years, there have been lots of um, re-engineering and recreating ways of doing family engagement. Um, I've heard about families um, being called at home, having text messages sent home when they couldn't do in-person programs, having conversations on the porch or sidewalk or at drop-off um, at bus stops, just lots of ways for really connecting, learning, and talking with parents. Some programs connected STEM in backpacks where families had all the materials and supplies to be able to do some STEM activities at home. Um, some programs like Scientific Adventures for Girls here increased their participation with families by having virtual events where families were able to do STEM activities in home and meet role models. And I especially loved hearing about all the new places of engaging with families from bringing programs to barbershops or laundromats or parks around the road with a traveling STEM van. So as we go to in-person, I hope we can really continue to reimagine these places and ways um, to connect with families. Next slide. Um, one quick point about thinking about professional development. Um, if we wanna go deep in reimagining family engagement, it's really important to be able to support staff with this work. STEM Next offers community of practice um, series. We hope that you'll check with us to see if you could participate in an upcoming one to really be able to deeply engage in the research and look for practical ways to be able to go deeper with family engagement by listening to families. I encourage you to make um, family engagement a regular part of reflection with all your staff in every single program element that you do. Next slide. I'll leave you with a set of resources, um, lots of different wonderful ways to be able to listen to families, to see how other programs around the country are really bringing family engagement to new communities in new ways. And then just a shout out to a really cool video that features Delia tinkering with families, it's really cool. And then STEM Next has a really cool um, planning tool book and a workbook to help you be able to develop goals and practices um, and practices for taking a vision and making it actionable. And now I'm really pleased to pass the baton to Delia who will talk about all the exciting work that she's doing. So take it away, Delia. Great. Well, thank you very much, Linda. I really appreciate all of your information. Um, hello to everyone. My name is Delia Meza, and I'm the Director of Family Learning and Community Partnerships at the New York Hall of Science. Uh, I actually manage a portfolio of programs for early learners, including science classes for neurodiverse students, uh, as well as managing a team that is responsible for incorporating family and community engagement across our entire institution. So if we can go on to the next slide. Great. And I'm excited to talk to you today about some strategies that I've incorporated um, in family engagement best practices in two of NYSEI's programs. The first one that I'll talk uh, a little bit about is called Little Maker Studio. And this is an after school program for students kindergarten to second grade and their caretakers. And also talk to you a little bit about what we do in the science play dates for neural diverse students. Next slide. Great. So in every program that we do, uh, we have a few tenets or a few strategies that we follow in an effort to engage the whole family and to strengthen relationships. The first is really to empower the parents or the caretakers. We aim to engage parents as playmates and their child's first science teacher while fostering positive parent-child interactions through the use of language, shared experiences, and mutual discovery. Um, we truly believe that by empowering parents and building their capacity, but above all their confidence, um, this can be, they can be powerful influencers in how children learn grow and thrive, and thrive not just in school, but in their lives in general. Uh, next slide, please. 
Great. And the second tenet or the second strategy that we use uh, to help us strengthen relationships is to practice something that we call materials literacy. So we do this by encouraging families to use familiar everyday objects in new and unexpected ways, and also to tinker with those materials or to play around or mess around with those materials. This focuses attention on the potential uses of materials and their properties in a shared experience. We really aim to scaffold materials exposure to help children and caregivers discover their properties and build confidence to combine everyday materials in innovative ways. One particular example that I have to share with you is the little weird teddy bear that's at the top of your screen right there. Um, so one of the programs that we had in our um, science play dates for neurodiverse students uh, was a program for Halloween, which we called Franken Toys. This is a program where we used um, old um, uh, toys that we repurposed and that you know, children were able to put together brand new toys out of recycled toys, and they could take them home with them. Well, I, I really wanted to share this example because it also gives us an opportunity to recognize that through materials literacy and tinkering with materials, the children are able to build narrative around what it is that they're making. So in this case, the family decided to use a tiny little um, uh, teddy bear that was actually missing an eye. So that's one of the reasons why it was there to tinker and to mess around with. Well, the entire family used materials that were available for making, and they gave it a brand new head. But what was really special is why the child put three different eyeballs on the uh, on on their Franken toy, and that is because the child said, in the event that it loses one, it it still has two, and it wouldn't be thrown away. So through materials literacy, it's really incredible the narratives that we get children to talk about and problem solve the situations that they encounter. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. So multi-generational learning is really at the heart of everything that we do and all of the family engagement programs and activities that we do at NISI because we try to bring experiences where children and caretakers engage in STEM learning together. And I think that that's the key term to remember, the fact that they're doing this together. And we also try to create an environment where children and caregivers build connections and really strengthen bonds between each other and their communities through a shared experience. We do it through strategies uh, such as, for example, giving parents their own tools to tinker with and mess around with. And also, more importantly, we do it by developing culturally relevant experiences that are significant and relatable to both caretaker and child. And we can go on to the next slide. One example of a culturally relevant experience that I have facilitated at NISI includes two workshops where we highlighted none other than the tortilla maker as a STEM tool. Now, just for a little bit of context, many years ago, tortillas, um, many years ago, including when my grandmother was very young. So we're talking about a very long time ago, but um, tortillas were actually made mainly by women. Uh, they were made by hand. And a woman would usually need to make 20 to 30 tortillas by hand just to feed an entire family. But thanks to engineering, the tortilla maker was invented as a new form of technology to solve the problem of making so many tortillas by hand. Now, all you really have to do is just take a, um, a little ball of corn dough, put it between two flat surfaces, and push a handle to flatten the tortilla. Uh, in case you guys are not aware of 
aware of, tortillas are a food staple in many Central and South American countries. And because many of our participating families were from Mexico and South America, they were familiar with this tool. Some, some of the families told me, that they shared with me that they even have this at home and that they were going to use it that night to make homemade tortillas. So it was really interesting um, to be able to use a tool that they were already familiar with. And I wanted, more importantly, families to recognize that the tortilla maker was a STEM tool. And I wanted them to see themselves as STEM learners. One another important thing to note in this particular workshop is that all the caretakers primarily spoke Spanish and therefore in an effort to respect and honor the diversity of the group, we decided to facilitate this program in their language. Whoopsies. One more. One more to the left. There we go. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, so we decided to do this program in Spanish because we wanted to create an environment where they felt they could engage as co-learners and their children's guide and teacher, just like what, what we had mentioned before, empowering parents and being able to give them confidence. So something very exciting happened. On the first day, we explored the tortilla maker as some printing tool. So on the bottom right-hand side, you're going to see that we made, uh, we made a colorful prints. We used the tortilla maker on foam circles to make really beautiful colorful prints with primary colors. So they were able to experience and explore the science of primary colors. Um, and also, Later on the following day, we decided to make tortillas in the lab. Now this was really important because we wanted the tortilla maker to be right next to the fancy schmancy microscopes. And we wanted the tortilla maker to be next to, you know, the laser cutter or the 3D printer for them to see the fact that this tool has value as a STEM tool as well. So it really does elevate their ideas about us, a tool that they already have at home. So on the second day, we decided to make some tortillas by hand. We added a little bit of food coloring for, uh, for color. And I thought that we were going to eat the tortillas, maybe put a little bit of salt, maybe a little bit of butter. But what actually happened, and now we can go on to the next slide, is that the caretakers felt so empowered at using a tool that they were familiar with, that without me knowing, they took it upon themselves to bring in all of the trimmings for a taco fiesta. I'm talking about they brought in the avocado salad, they brought in the chicken and the beans and the cheeses and the spices and everything that you can need in order for you to make homemade tacos, not at home, but certainly at the museum. And I think that my goal was really to make sure that all the participants felt engaged and supported throughout this learning process. I mean, ultimately incorporating culturally relevant experiences that the families are already familiar with helped build this mutual feeling of trust that would lead to a shared ownership of the workshop and created positive shared experiences between families and staff because the children served, the children were so cute because they served as waiters and waitresses and were actually passing around um, the, the, the tacos to all of the staff members in the offices. So that was, that was in, an incredible, an incredible thing to see. And throughout this experience, I really wanted to create a sense of community among the families where they felt comfortable and knowledgeable to incorporate their background knowledge and experiences too. Why? Because I'm not the keeper of all of the knowledge. I'm not the science teacher whom they should look up to. I'm 
you know, an educator right along with the teachers. Remember that before, one of our strategies is to empower the parents as their child's first playmates and first teachers. So that's what I was there for, um, to really empower them and create a sense of community with them. And I noticed that all of the families were extremely excited and as you guys can probably guess, much more engaged with the activity because they were tinkering with a tool that they were familiar with. And I hope that by using a familiar cultural object, we laid the foundation for a relevant and engaging exploration of STEM. But I should also say STEAM because the arts are very important in this equation as well. And we can go on to the next slide. And here is my contact information, which I truly do hope that I hear from some of you in this webinar this afternoon or this morning, um, even if it's just to say hello or for me to share with you the colorful tortillas recipe, um, I'd be more than happy to you know, to be uh, a platform for you to share some of the ideas that you have um, for incorporating more culturally relevant experiences in your programs. Thank you, and I'll pass it over to our next presenter, Smirla. Thank you, Lelia. It's uh, so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was lovely to see all the pictures of families really engaging in fun activities together. Uh, my name is Mirla Ramos Montañez. I'm a family STEM learning researcher at Turk, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, math and science education institution. Uh, during the last seven or eight years, I've been interested in working with families, especially Latinx families around the Portland metro area and supporting their engagement with STEM. Uh, when I first started working with families, I was uh, very much focused on access creating and providing culturally relevant opportunities for families. And I would say now, as I've continued to grow in my thinking about equity, I think access is very important, but I've been working more alongside families uh, to better understand their goals, their values, and to find ways that we can push on systems that have marginalized families, especially families of color. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here with you and to learn uh, from you and your experiences. Next slide, please. Uh, before I start, I just want to recognize that the work and the ideas that I'm talking about today have emerged from a wonderful team of researchers and practitioners that share a similar vision of empowering families to redefine STEM and push on our ideas about STEM engagement. Uh, and in particular, I wanted to thank my colleague, Dr. Scott Pattison, Dr. Gene Swarovski at Notre Dame University, as well as our partners in Mountain Hood Community College Head Start and Metropolitan Family Service. And of course, a special thank you also goes to the National Science Foundation uh, that's providing funding for the two projects that I'll talk about today. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I thought it would be important um, before I kind of tell you a little bit about the uh, projects that I'll discuss today to tell you about the principles that are guiding our work and our approach. I feel like these are important in two ways. One, because it lays the foundation to uh, for you to maybe understand how we make decisions in terms of the methods that we use or the approaches that we use to create activities for families. And two, I thought that it might be a good way or it's, it's a nice set of principles that you might want to consider as you work with families or that you're already practicing. And some of these may not sound uh, revolutionary, but are aspects that I think sometimes are not brought to the forefront, especially when we're designing or thinking about how we're going to engage uh, families with STEM. So the first one, um, I think Kata, we're, there's one before, one slide before that one. There, there you go, thank you. The first one that I wanna highlight, and I think we all know this, is that family learning is unique. 
Um, you know, it's a highly social process. It involves adults and children of different ages who have different dynamics. Uh, it's motivated by a variety of goals and values and interests that sometimes we're not, we're not aware of as we put on programs or activities. And sometimes we don't even understand them as well. Um, as you know, if you're a part of a family, family learning can happen at any time. Like my kids are, uh, they love to talk in the car. And when we're writing in the car, sometimes they have really difficult questions um, that I face to answer in the, you know, at the moment. And I sometimes fumble around to try to answer. Uh, but they happen anywhere, at supermarket, at bedtime. And often those moments might look insignificant to some, but together they add to a powerful learning trajectory for families. And it connects to that second principle. And that is that uh, family-based experiences outside of school are so important. And they're the primary learning context for young children. And often what happens is that we uh, tend to look at those experiences are irrelevant or of little importance, especially when compared to things and activities that happen in a school setting, in a formal setting. Next slide, please. Uh, principles three and four are related, and that is that, you know, we know this from working with families, and it's been well documented in the literature that families already engage in STEM in very rich ways at home and in other informal learning contexts. And so they have rich knowledge and experiences that they're bringing. And our approach should not be to figure out how we get families to engage with STEM necessarily, but really understand how families are already engaging with STEM at home and how we can leverage all that knowledge and rich assets that they have to provide a great experience for them. And I think finally, and uh, other folks have said it too, I think the more and more time I spend working with families, sometimes I wonder what I'm bringing to the table because I feel like I learn so much more from them than they might learn from me or from our group. And so I think it's really important that we shift or change our vision to be one that really puts us all at an equal playing field. Researchers, practitioners, families, parents, we're all in the same field, supporting each other in common goals. And often those common goals are the well-being, the knowledge, and the learning for our children. Next slide. So today I want to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we are uh, learning about as we work with families in STEM. Uh, there are two examples that I'll be presenting, and I want to let you know that we mostly work with families that have preschool age children between the ages of three and five, and uh, those families are part of preschool programs across here in the metro area, and we're looking at the way that families' interest and engagement with uh, engineering design process gets sparked. Uh, our goals are to explore the ways that families engage already with engineering at home and describe what engineering with young children looks like, uh, which we know can be very different from what happens in a formal classroom. And we're really interested in trying to understand how interest is sparked and can be sustained across time. Next slide, please. So the two projects that I will tell you a little bit about have one thing in common. Well, they have many things, but this is one of the main things. And uh, that is that we are using a series of uh, home-based engineering design activities that we have developed, tested, and iterated with families. So you can see some of the examples of those activities there in that slide. All activities are bilingual, Spanish and English. And uh, they use a song, a book, a storyboard to support family engagement and the development of a narrative that really supports families engaging with a design challenge. So I will give you one example. Uh, on the very first picture on the left hand side, you see the little, oh, sorry, the light in the room went out. One second. 
No worries, Smirla. I'll, I'll just take a quick moment to uh, let folks know we will have a Q&A at the end of all of these presentations. So as questions come up, you can feel free to type those in the chat. We'll track them there. Um, but we'll also invite folks to unmute themselves, turn on their video cameras, and ask your questions yourselves. And with that, I will turn it back to Smirla. Thank you, Marissa. Sorry, the, there's a timer on the light. You know, I, I went into a small room to so my kids wouldn't interrupt me during spring break. <laughs> so the light went off. Um, so I was telling you about the picture there on the left hand side. Uh, that's one of our kids. It's, called, it's an activity called Pollitos. And uh, we use a popular Latin American song called Los Pollitos Dicen to really engage families in building a narrative context around like what would these wind up chicks that are there might need to be safe and be comfortable. And so families sing the song, they read a book, they look at a storyboard, they make up their own story. And they really talk about the needs that the chicks have. Well, they might need a, a tall tower to sleep on so that they're protected or they might need food or they might need shelter. And they use the blocks and, and other materials to really work through the activity. And of course, like the wind up chicks are very popular. Kids test it out. They uh, they put them everywhere in the house and they just sort of become part of their regular playing routine. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so the first project I want to tell you a little bit about is called Reach ECE. It's a project where we worked with 16 families to understand what aspects of those activities that I showed you in the previous slide uh, work to support engagement and interest for families. We tested the three activities that I showed you across three rounds of iterations. And so families received a kit and they were asked to videotape themselves when they first played with the activity. Because of COVID, I'm sure you know there are many different challenges and we spent some time thinking about how we could best do this without adding a uh, burden to families. So we created some Zoom links and every family had a different Zoom meeting link that they could join from their phone at any time whenever they were ready to play with the activities. And once they joined that Zoom link, the meeting would automatically record. Families would play there however long they wanted to and however they wanted to. And when they were done, they just stopped or exited the meeting. That video automatically uploaded to our cloud and we got a notification that the, the video was ready to view. And so in addition to that video, we also had in-depth conversations with families about their experiences where they told us what worked, what didn't work, what they liked or they didn't like. And um, then we would quickly make those changes to the activities and then give out a new activity for families to try. So I think that relationship with families, uh, we were testing this together. We didn't know what would work was really important. And we learned a lot about how we can set up these kinds of home-based activities, the types of design challenges that we might provide, the types of materials that might be in there, which I think is really relevant, especially during COVID where we turned into a lot of home-based activities and kits. Everybody was trying to produce them really quickly and send them out. So spending the time and really thinking about uh, what goes in those kits is very important. And then the next example is in the next slide. Um, we also use those activities in a program called Head Start and Engineering. And in this project, we use the activities, but we also provide a multi-component program that's designed to engage families again with the engineering design process and really explore how families engage with engineering in their everyday lives. And so through the program, families receive the activities, then they're encouraged to share their experience by sending pictures and reflections of their experiences. And then we upload those onto a private program website that all participants have access to so they can join, uh, they can look at the website and see what other families are doing. And then we host monthly parent meetings or community meetings where parents come in and we talk about what they did, what challenges they encounter. We talk about what engineering is, what kind of everyday problem solving they're doing. And then families also have conversations with a family liaison. So every family, they participate, it's a year long program. They participate with us and one of us works as a family liaison. So we're in charge of holding that family's hands throughout the program, making sure they feel supported and if they need help, um, that they can have that help that they need and support. 
And then we have those in-depth conversations about what's working. And I feel like in this model, it's been really helpful to understand and learn about what family goals are, what values they have, and how programs like this may align or not uh, with those goals and values, and thinking about how a program could spark various interest pathways. And so for many of the families that are participating in the program, spending time together is a very important value or goal that they have. And so it's not necessarily, at the beginning, it's not necessarily about the engineering. It's more about having the opportunity to spend time together. And then through there, they're seeing these activities are helping them do that and fostering really nice interactions and rich conversations. And so they, that might spark an interest on engineering or something else. And so I would say, next slide, please that um, these are just two like examples and very briefly, because we don't have that much time, I told you a little bit about each one, but I feel like there are examples of how we can involve families authentically in research and practice. And they show how we can work to being equal partners in the development and learning for young children. So say in closing, if you take anything away uh, from what I just shared with you, it would be this. and that I think our goal as researchers, practitioners, educators, however you see yourself, should not be to identify what families don't know or what gaps there may be or to try to fill any of those perceived gaps. It really should be to elevate the knowledge and practices that are already present in families' lives and to co-build on those to meet family goals. So thank you so much. And I think I will pass it on to Marissa and Linda for questions maybe. Yes, thank you, Smirla. And thank you, Delia. You both had so many great examples of different ways to engage with families and to really form those partnerships and, and trust in sort of the code development. Um, Smirla, I liked how you talked about how, you know, we all have the same goal right in the end right which is really about helping to support these children in their paths to become whomever they choose to be um so with that kata i think we can stop screen sharing as we get into some q a so we can see each other's lovely faces and um, I mentioned this earlier, if you have a question that you would like to ask yourself, you can use the, if you go to the reactions button in your Zoom, there is a raise hand um, button. You can click that there and be able to ask your question yourself. Um, you can also type your question into the chat. I'll keep an eye on that and voice over any questions that come through. But to kick us off in the q and I think we'll get started with um, some questions we were thinking about earlier. So let's see. Um, I know sometimes I hear from educators and program staff that it's, it's hard to get that first point of contact sometimes with families when they're trying to engage them. So what do you think is the most kind of important first step when you're trying to engage families or strengthen engagement with families? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question, right? How do you <laughs> how do you engage them um, you know, first? And I think that by, you know, this might sound simplistic, but it really is, you know, a very important thought, uh, which is to invite them, right? Oftentimes, uh, I know that in my museum, they see the museum as a building that is not that is not for them. So primarily I work with Latino communities and you know, oftentimes they see the museum as not for them. They see the museum as, you know, just another building in the neighborhood, but you know, I think that it's important to to extend that invitation wherever it is that the parents are or the caretakers are. So whether it's in the laundromat, whether it's in the supermarket, whether it's, you know, um, joining some faith faith based organizations, I think that that might be a way of really capturing some of the parents. Another thing that I'd like to share, too, is looking for those first opportunities to make a contact with a parent where you're sharing something positive. 
So oftentimes parents get a phone call or a text and think, oh no, what did my child do wrong today at school or in my after school program? So if you're able to send something that, or even a picture where it's like, oh, you know, your daughter today really persisted and figured out this challenge that nobody else could do in our program, or she helped others do it. And sharing something positive about what their child's doing um, that really makes parents, you know, feel really good about it and starts to build that relationship and connection with the staff and also with your program. Yeah, I think it's about, what I've tried to tell myself is always about reciprocal relationship building. So if I'm asking families to do something, I wanna do that too. And I wanna share myself and I wanna to try to find ways to build trust slowly and uh, in small ways, but at the end, you know, it really pays off. So just having that opportunity to like that connection and working closely with community organizations, like Delia said, um, to really find that entry point um, and, you know, provide something. You just have to highlight what you're providing or what you want to do and try to figure out how that is valuable or aligned with what families are really interested in. Thank you. We had a question come through the chat from Irma. How do you engage public school systems, particularly middle or high school, to engage their, with their families in STEM? Just beyond you know, the one big STEM night a year that might happen. How can you get, help form stronger partnerships and engagement with maybe the families of older students in public schools? This is a tough question. But I think that it is um, it is recognizing that it's a lot harder uh, to engage, you know, uh, caretakers and families of older students because the older that child gets, the less they want the parent involved. Um, so it's like, oh, you know, get away from me, parent. You are, you know, in the school with my friends, and you know, I don't want, I, I, I don't want to be seen with you, or you know things like that. But one of the things that we do at our museum is really um, partner with other organizations. Uh, you know, for example, we have a partnership with JetBlue in which we talk about, you know, the science and STEM of aviation. So I would, you know, certainly suggest to, to find other organizations that, you know, might be able to help support some of these things. I think also to thinking about making a safe place um, at a school site or an after school program that's for parents so parents can connect with each other um, and see each other as a resource and also where there are resources available. And I think also to talking with the families of middle schoolers and high schoolers to find out, you know, what are they in need of and looking for so that you can address what's of interest to them and to recognize that their engagement you know, maybe taking place at home or in the car rides with those conversations that it isn't always about them coming to school, that they're, you know, doing a lot and validating that. And, and I can echo from just some of my experience of working with youth at around that age, um, you know, taking the time to figure out what are their interests and hobbies and then finding sort of like the STEM moments that relate to those interests and hobbies. If they're really into video games, for example, there's tons and tons that you can talk about related to STEM and encourage them to maybe try out some coding of their own or try out some graphic design or things like that related to hobbies that they might have, even you know, sports or art or all kinds of things, as we know, and as was shared with us throughout the presentations today, right? STEM is in our everyday lives all around us all the time. So maybe showing that you're interested and invested or helping parents and family members to find those, those elements of what their, their children are already interested and invested in and kind of capitalizing on that. All right, let's see if any other questions came through the chat here. I'm also looking for hands raised. If you would like to raise your hand, feel free and use that. So another question we have is, um, what misconceptions have families perhaps had when it comes to STEM learning and how have you helped them to address those misconceptions? I would say, Marissa, that often 
we are the ones that have the misconceptions and not families. Um, so, you know, I think for us, what's been really powerful and like parents across programs really notice is that the fact that they do do a lot of the things um, at home already, that they engage richly in STEM, um, that they do like critical problem solving every day. And, um, you know, they're, I think the more and more they're exposed, they realize and they start seeing that everywhere and they talk to their kids about what they're doing. So it just sort of becomes a little bit more kind of in their face <laughs> sort of STEM. Uh, but often I think the misconceptions that happen uh, happen from like assumptions that we take when going into those spaces. Sometimes two parents have stereotypes um, about what they think, especially with girls, what they think their girl might be interested in. Um, and sometimes it's not STEM. And I know just having conversations with parents or being able to show them that like, you know, your daughter, like we had a summer program that was called Cars and Engines where girls got under the hood and took apart engines and learned how they work and put together lawnmower engines. And then parents said like, you know, I never, you know, would have thought that my daughter would be interested in doing something like that but just giving them that opportunity to try something out and then having a conversation really kind of um, help parents expand their ideas in terms of what their daughters might be interested in doing. Thank you so much. And I see we have um, Martina is raising her hand. Go ahead, Martina, you can unmute and ask your question. Hello, hi, hi everyone. Thank you for this webinar. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I had a question. I'm coming from like a slightly different perspective. I'm a scientist, but also right now I work at, in science journalism. And I'm interested in getting um, young people interested in science through using journalism, especially like um, younger audience who are historically underrepresented, including girls as well. So my question is like, how would you say that like learning all the different ways that you engage different families and communities. How could I like do that from a journalism perspective, especially when sometimes in news and journalism, a lot of people don't trust journalists, but then also don't trust science. So it's like a double distrust. Thank you. Yeah, so Martina, I you know, I've worked with very young students uh, in the past. Uh, you're right, that's that's a really great question, um, you know, and with neurodiverse students. But one of the things that we've uh, certainly uh, have tried, well, we've tried two things. One is definitely to try and bring that literacy component to any activity that we do. So that literacy component could be, you know, a uh, a, a child, um, a children's storybook, for example, that we use to kind of jumpstart the engineering thinking of the young child. Um, and another thing that we've done, and I've done this with my neurodiverse students, is that we've written about what it is that we have encountered in science experiments or in science phenomenon. So kind of reporting it out to each other um, has definitely been a way for them to hone in on their observational skills and really practice how to um, how to relay that information. I don't have a good answer, Martina, but uh, your question made me think about uh, research that has been happening. Um, I think her name is Alicia Torres from Child Trends. And they look at the way to engage Hispanic families with new stories and uh, engage them with STEM. So that might be like a good resource to check out. I could definitely add the, um, the site there on the chat if that might be helpful for you. And I know that there's other um, media projects that NSF funds around engaging families with STEM through media. And so if you go on um, informalscience.org, you can search the projects there and there might be connections that you can make with other researchers or practitioners that might provide some more insight that would be helpful for you. You know, we have just- oh, This is so helpful, thank you. Thanks everyone for asking these great questions. 
I know we have just a few minutes left um, of the webinar and wanted to move on to our last couple of um, touch points. Um, in the chat, what we'd like to do is to invite each of you to write one thing that you will do after this um, webinar. And we know that right now organizations are facing lots of different challenges, you know, from shorting uh, of staff to reductions in funding. So just thinking about, um, I know that this will impact your family engagement, but how might you take an action or an idea that you heard from today to reimagine your family engagement and your program? And it could be something very small or large, depending on your community um, and the resources that you have. Linda, I'm just going to voice over some of the things I see coming through the chat here. Um, so the idea of using familiar tools like the tortilla press, yes, using uh, highlighting and sort of uplifting everyday STEM tools to that same level as things like high powered microscopes. Um, discussing ways to incorporate diverse backgrounds into programs and learning from the examples seen today, building relationships with families in the community setting up family conversation nights. Wonderful, some really great action items coming out of this webinar today. We love to hear it, keep them coming. Uh, training families and educators about informal learning and why informal learning is so important. The idea around materials literacy, empowering STEM exploration with materials you have in your own homes. Connecting with some grant partners to think about building family engagement with high schoolers. Fabulous. Checking out some of the recommended resources. Uh, the Franken toy idea, thinking of new ways to repurpose materials and engage families in learning together. Great. We'd love to see these, these fantastic ideas. And as you saw throughout the presentation, all three of our speakers did share their contact information. Um, so you can feel free to reach out to them individually if you would like to learn more or want to, you know, talk through some ideas you're having. Um, and the slide deck will be shared with you after the webinar as well. We can go to the next slide. And as we close out our time together today, and GCP just wanted to let you know of two upcoming webinars. We have a webinar on April 20th, hosted in collaboration with the Million Girl Moonshot, called The M in STEM, Math in Everyday Life. The webinar will focus on ways that math is prevalent and relevant in everyday life, including in after-school spaces. And we'll learn about ways to recognize and embrace authentic math moments and activities to engage after-school youth in math. And on May 3rd, we will host an event with Girls Steam Ahead with NASA. This is their Girls Steam Ahead with NASA free resources webinar. During the webinar, presenters will provide a brief overview of the program and its myriad of free astronomy resources, including a range of computer and paper-based activities, print products, and a program cookbook for facilitators. And last but not least, we always would love for you to fill out a post-webinar survey these surveys are so important in helping us to improve our webinar processes and topics and to make sure that we're bringing you content and information and speakers that are relevant and important and helpful to all of you. So I think Katja is going to pop the link to the survey there in the chat. If you can take a few mo moments today to complete that for us, we would greatly appreciate it. And with that, we are coming to the end of our time. Thank you to Linda, Delia, and Smirla for your time and expertise and conversations today. I know I have learned a lot. And thank you to our audience members for your great interaction and questions throughout the course of the webinar. We hope to see you at another NGCP event soon.